my name is Emily and I'm the founder of Vespol. And it's actually really nice to see uh, so many familiar faces today. But if you don't know us, uh, our mission at Vespod is to empower women financially. So we do three things at Vespod. We organize uh, workshops and classes around personal finances. We send you a weekly newsletter talking about money. And we also bring together this amazing community uh, that is all of us. So it's really like a supportive, friendly community. And hopefully, you can feel it uh, today during the event. So we started uh, organizing this Vespot series because I wanted to bring, to transform basically your experience with finance. So that means bringing a role model, very inspiring women to come and share their experiences in the world of finance, but also what they do in their career. And today I'm really, really happy because we have Helena Morisse. So of course you all know her, but I'm gonna do a quick intro of Helena, Helena before, before she comes on stage. So. For me, Elena uh, is, is really exceptional and for a few reasons. She's very successful. So Helena now is the head of personal investing at LG and she's working on a really big mission that is to engage the nation to save and invest more. So of course we really love that at Vespol. And previously she was the CEO of Newton Investment Management for 15 years. She's a big believer in diversity, but she's not only talking about it, she's really acting on it and she's driving change. She launched the 30% Club, and she's, been, she's actually announced some really big success this year, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, and she's um, also launched the Diversity Project, and in 2017, she was made a dam, actually, for services, which is amazing. And she published a book, A Good Time to Be a Girl. We read it in our book club, so I'm sure a lot of you have already read it, and we're going to discuss it today. And last but not least, she has nine kids, which is amazing. <laughs> And I just wanted to say that for me, um, Elena is really, is really amazing for, for two reasons. The first one is she's a mom, I'm also a mom, and I understand the commitment and the time. So I'm really, really thankful that she can spend an hour with us today uh, because I, I know her time is, is really, really precious. Um, and the second one is I worked in finance for, for about 10 years and I realized how difficult is this industry and how challenging uh, it is every day. So seeing someone that spent more than 30 years working in finance and being like one of the greatest leaders in the city is really amazing for me. So thank you, Elena, for, for being here today. Um, we'll do a 40, 45 minute conversation with Elena. We'll open for Q&A, so please write down all your questions. And I think the, the purpose of the talk today is really to get to know Elena, to get inspired, but I also want you to learn from each other. So there's a little exercise I wanted to do uh, before we start. So if you can find someone next to you that you haven't talked to before, and if you can do two things, the first one is, can you tell this person what you think you're good at? And can you tell her also what your biggest challenge at the moment? I'll give you one minute. Hi, Elena. Good morning. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Yeah. How are you? Welcome. It's good, good to be here. Community. Thank you. We're really, really happy to have you here today. Oh, thank you. And you know, initially I wanted to organize a very small and intimate breakfast, and that's a true story. So I was looking for a very Just small menu, friends. 30 people, <laughs> and in the end they were like, no, we all want to see Elena, so you're, oh. you're really a star. <laughs> well, I hope I fulfill expectations. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> um, so I wanted to start by talking a little bit about yourself, your career, and where, where do you come from. So I know your parents were teachers, so I mean from, you know, like your parents' teacher, you studied in Cambridge. How did you end up working in finance? Well, actually, by accident. Um, I mean, I'm very ordinary uh, background. Um, but actually, I was born near Manchester, and um, all my family are teachers. And I went to comprehensive school, co-educational school, and I had really very little idea about what I wanted to do after I left university. I started philosophy at university, which actually I would say has come in more useful than people might think. Um, but actually, friends of mine were applying to the city and said, um, it was quite different application process than it is now. You didn't really need to do internships and so forth. And said, oh, you'd be good at it. You know, it's kind of a bit of numbers. I've done, you know, maths and further maths at A level. And um, also talking, as you'll find out, I like talking. Um, and uh, writing. And, you know, you, you should give it a go. And because I didn't know what I wanted to do, I uh, applied. And then I have to say, one of the reasons I decided to accept the job that I was offered was because I was very inspired by you know one particular interview. I can remember it very, very well. It was a man and a woman interviewing me. And what struck me, the woman was actually a venture capitalist. I didn't know that wouldn't be what I would be doing. I didn't know the differences between different things. But actually, she seemed to really love her job. 
And I didn't realize that was maybe a little bit unusual that there would be a woman, a senior woman. Um, it's still a very um, male dominated area of finance as are just about all areas. But anyway, so, and I, and I felt, I found I enjoyed it. I, I sort of lucked out really. So how did you, you know, find your way in this world of finance? I, I started working for Lehman in 2008 and I thought, you know, it was, it was quite, you know, cynical to be a, to be a banker or the environment uh, at the time. And it was really like male dominated and I saw a lot of, you know, politics internally. So how do you, you know, manage your way and, and, and you know, find your allies basically in this journey? Well, I have to say my first uh, two career experiences, as those of you who read the book will know, were very, very different. Um, and um, I, was, I suppose in the first instance, because I went to New York for a couple of years, I was somewhat lulled into a false sense of security about you know, how many women there were in finance. There were a couple of very, very powerful women in the small office where I worked. And they seemed to call the shots and you know, c control their own destiny. And I could see, uh, I felt that you know, that was the norm. I mean, I was 21 years old. Um, I had no idea until I came back to London and found myself the only woman in a team of 16 bond fund managers. Um, and as I set out in the book, I soon after had my first child. And when I returned from maternity leave, I was passed over for promotion. It was the very first rung on the ladder. And I had, until that point, and I was 25, I'd never, ever thought that my gender would have anything to do with how far I could progress. And you could say, well, that was a bit naive, given that I was the only woman in the team. But actually, I just thought, well, I'm working as hard as them, and I'm performing as well as them. Um, but I was told when I asked, you know, what areas did I need to improve to get the promotion next time around, I was told, well, there's nothing wrong with your performance, but there is some doubt over your commitment with a baby. Now... No one would ever say that these days, but actually I knew where I stood and it suddenly made me realize that finance wasn't kind of this, I just thought it was you know, about aptitude. Um, and it was a very energized time. Um, there was Wall Street, the first movie, And although I didn't like the line, greed is good, um, it was done in a slightly sort of funny way. And then there was a obviously a moral to that story. Um, Working Girl came out. Um, and although Sigourney Weaver's character obviously is not somebody as a role model, she dressed well. You know, there was some sort of like glamorous bits to the whole thing. Um, and that was all a big shock. But then you use the word ally, Emily, uh, just now. And that was the real turning point for me when I joined Newton and really, really benefited from um, Stuart Newton, who'd founded the firm, effectively becoming my mentor. Um, and it's something I believe in now. I mean, people often discuss mentoring or sponsorship, or if there's just someone who will spend some time with you, be generous, encourage you when you have those moments of self-doubt, it can make a huge amount of difference. What is going on upstairs? Is, is there something, you know, <laughs> the roof's going to fall people in are or coming. something. <laughs> um, can we take a step back and can you tell us What's a bond trader and hmm. what, what, you know, what is Newton and what was your role sure. there? Because I think for most people, the finance industry is you know, very blur and we don't really know what, what people are doing. Yeah, so, um, I mean, to be honest, in my first job, I was jack of all trades or Jill of all trades. Anyway, um, and bonds are you know, debt instruments. So when a company is um, uh, looking to grow, it will, and want people to, to involved in that growth, it will issue equity and people will buy into that. For the upside bonds, you are giving a loan. And, um, you know, the plan is you'll get payback and you'll get interest on top of that. And a lot of uh, pension funds have a mixture of bonds and equities in them because they're supposed to be a bit less risky. Um, and so it's quite a mathematical uh, subject compared with equity investment because there you're l looking less at, say, the management and more at the actual finances of a company. But to be honest, in my first job, I was doing everything. I would be buying or selling the bonds and I would be settling the trades, you know, actually making sure that we actually got the ownership. I would be valuing them. I would be writing the reports. This would not work in today's world where you've got all these separation of duties. But actually, that was a huge um, benefit for me to actually get to see all of that. But all the time, I, I realized... Um, as I got to familiar with what um, the purpose was behind what I was doing, it was clearly about creating you know, better outcomes for ultimately you know, the beneficiaries of the pension funds, uh, and it was usually pension money. Um, and that seemed to me, well, a good thing to be doing. It's not the cure for cancer, but it's actually helping people's financial health, which is obviously something that 
we both care about uh, significantly. But it's not how people perceive finance, I think. I think they think of finance as just, um, you know, especially the city and, you know, the actual industry as very much removed from their daily lives and actually very much around people who are trying to, you know, get rich at the expense of everybody else rather than actually, you know, trying to do something um, helpful to them. And uh, so you so you work for you join Newton uh, after working for Schroders I think uh, in New yeah. York so you moved back to to London and you became the CEO of Newton at 35 uh, years old so that's quite young to be a, a CEO of a 20 billion uh, pension fund so Newton is basically taking people money pensions money into pension and, and investing it so managing people's money um, how did it feel becoming a CEO at, at 35 and you already had a few kids uh, like kind four of kids. scary um, and I was not um, prepared for it in, in any way and I had never had any management training or um, done an MBA or anything like that. It was not a textbook journey um, and actually it was only seven years after I had joined Newton and Newton's a much smaller firm than my previous one, much less hierarchical, much more meritocratic. Um, uh, I'm sure Schroeder's is very meritocratic now but at the time, I mean this was a long time ago obviously. Um, and it was really built, what was something that I really need to convey and because I learned a lot about diversity through this it wasn't that um, you know there was some sort of initiatives around diversity and inclusion it was absolutely at the heart of the uh, business approach so basically the whole investment philosophy how we made decisions was based on this motto or saying that no one had a monopoly on great ideas and so it was it was absolutely core to have these almost like arguments, frankly, um, I wouldn't say fights, but, you know, arguments, uh, rather than just say, oh, well, you know, there are these reasons to invest in this instrument and those reasons not to, let's kind of do something in the middle. Um, it, we would sort of thrash it out. Um, and I was welcomed because I was a bit different. Um, and that was such an empowering thing because actually I didn't ever have to hide the fact that, you know, I had, by the time I came CEO, actually I had five children and the youngest had just had their first, second and third birthdays. So it was logistically a very challenging time in my life, I've got to admit, but um, I felt it was, it was very exciting to be um, valued for actually who I was rather than trying to sort of lean in or fit in with some sort of more hierarchical, traditional ways of working. Yeah, and I think that's something you describe really, really well in your book, and a lot of people have been making the comparison with you know, lean in and, you know, is a good time to be a girl, the new lean in. And I, I really agree with you that, you know, staying yourself, and I think that's what we're trying to do in the, you know, in the Vespod community also. It's, you know, what are your values, what, what do you stand for, and how you can, you know, bring change by, like, putting forward all these values, actually. Um, so when you become the CEO, I mean, did you, was it scary? Uh, how, di how did you manage like all the emotions around, around your role? So, I mean, I literally was, you know, running a, a part of the, the business, um, but I wasn't expecting to suddenly be running all of it. And I must admit, uh, you know, the day one, I was looking in the cardboard box for a sort of business plan somewhere and trying to get my bearings. It was a baptism of fire. I made loads and loads of mistakes, including sort of probably the worst one in the early week, the first week was picking up the phone to the, and it was the Daily Mail, you know, which um, I now know not to talk to off the cuff, but I didn't at the time, there was no sort of training about what not to say. Um, and yeah, there was an awful lot of um, things to contend with. It was just the start of a much, um, although not like it is today, but a tougher regulatory regime. Um, and what I needed to do though was, um, was I realized, because I mean, the reason I took it wasn't just because I wanted the job title, but because I really felt strongly that what Newton was doing as an investment um, firm was actually, because of this principle on which it was based around the sort of philosophy of diversity, that actually we had something really special. And I would, and it was a wonderful opportunity to be able to lead that, nurture that, and to um, develop it. And so, but I knew I had to kind of, first of all, build a... Um, I suppose my, my relationships with all of the uh, people who are now reporting to me that I was, you know, one minute I was, well, in some cases, reporting to them. Um, and that was pretty tough, actually. That was probably the hardest thing, as it would be anywhere. I mean, this isn't peculiar to that situation. And my colleagues were very supportive. Um, they kind of gave me the mandate to leave, but it was still difficult. Um, and I suppose what I learned there was being an effective leader was, in this instance anyway, very much about being 
just about first among equals. But actually, again, I was not there sort of massively ahead of everybody. This is what you've got to do. It wasn't command and control. It was about building a consensus about the vision for the company. And I guess reason why I, I sort of then got involved later in terms of women's uh, initiatives uh, was very much because I think we women often lead in a bit of a different way to men. So it's not an anti-men kind of comment, but I think the way we lead is often through being very empathetic and very much involving other people um, and then making a decision about what to do rather than just telling them what to do. And I think that's what we need in the world today, a bit more sort of people who are, you know, inspiring people rather than forcing them. And um, so that's why I say don't lean into what's out there already and don't try to become, you know, just like an honorary man. For a start, we'll probably be less good at it than the real men would be at being men. Um, but, you know, it, it, you know, dress like a woman, enjoy, you know, like be yourself, not um, just superficially, but actually how you lead. And you also have very strong ideas around diversity. You're talking a lot about it. You launched a few initiatives. How can you manage? I mean, this is for me like you're an entrepreneur. So at the same time, like you're, you know, you're leading your team and you're driving these very large scale projects at the same time. How do you manage your, your time and your energy between all these things? Well, not always terribly well, I've got to admit. Um, but, you know, sometimes, um, you know, I get exhausted like everybody else. And I've, I have learned to prioritize and to be less phased, um, less overwhelmed, or try to be less overwhelmed about what might lie, you know, two weeks away. I just kind of, you know, it's one step at a time. Um, and I know it's much easier said than done sometimes, because we all have that kind of little voice of not doubt necessarily, but sometimes doubt and sometimes just, well, I don't know if I can do that. Um, but actually, I think we have a lot of capacity in us. Um, and a lot of the time we worry so much about what might go wrong that we forget we might actually succeed as well. And um, we particularly enjoyed as a family watching Incredibles 2 in the summer. Uh, all sorts of parallels because my husband's at home. And I love the scene where Mr. Incredibles is saying, you know, he's he's talking to the little fashion lady who's, have you seen anyone seen the film? Anyway, it's, um, and he's saying, he looks terrible, he looks a complete mess. He's an absolute wreck. He's got bags under his eyes. He hasn't slept. And he's like, I put a red sock in with a whitewash and I, I think we need eggs. You know, my husband and I kind of looked at each other, you know, sort of. Um, Elastigirl is not quite how I'd characterize myself, but there is, you know, we can stretch ourselves quite a bit before we kind of, you know, hopefully don't, you know, break, but, um, and I've done, I've got to the point sometimes when I've taken on too much and then I kind of retrench a bit and re-energize. Do you, do you feel uh, lonely as a leader? I don't particularly. I mean, I think it is really important to have allies and to um, have people that you can turn to on any situation. And I think that's how I've always operated. So whether they be sort of peers, whether they be colleagues, whether they be my husband, whether they be friends and people who, um, you know, you can just pick up the phone to um, and speak about issues. It can be very lonely, I think. But, but if you lead in a way that is collaborative, it, sh it shouldn't be. It's another sort of, you know secret I think about it it doesn't have to be uh, an isolated position ultimately you obviously have to sometimes be recognizing it's not a popularity contest you might have to make you know decisions that aren't particularly uh, make you liked um, and I and I would recognize in myself I like to be liked I mean I, I've, I've come to see that if there's a period where I've had to do some things that I'm really uncomfortable with feel like it's taking a step back to go forward um, you know, that can be very uncomfortable. But yeah, I think it's how, it's how you go about it that makes the leadership role sort of, I don't want to say bearable, but you know, either enjoyable or a bit of a nightmare all the time. So who's, who's your support network today? Is it people within the company, people outside of the company, your different projects? I assume your family is, uh, you know, a big support for you. Yeah, it's all, all of the above, really. I mean, I suppose um, if I was going to sort of draw a picture, it's like a sort of, you know, concentric circles. And clearly my, uh, my team, um, and it's a relatively uh, small team. Um, the person investing business is a new business for legal in general. Uh, we run almost a trillion pounds of assets, but mainly on behalf of big companies. And very few people come directly to us. And we think we could use our scale 
you know, the fact that a lot of people have insurance policies, for example, with us to try to reach lots of people. I think there's there's lots of room. I think it's wonderful what Best Bottle is doing. It's very complimentary. We're trying to do things from the bottom up, things from the top down. Um, but my team is really, uh, it's a very entrepreneurial group. Um, and we're having to, in a way, be a small business, like a startup, within a very, very large one. And of course, that's challenging. But it's challenging for everybody and me being there for them. Um, and it has upsides too. And then my family, I mean, if all else fails or if I come home from work and really kind of, you know, shattered from whatever the day has thrown at me, um, I have to admit the, the side, normally when I come home, there are two animate objects running towards me. One is our uh, one-year-old cockapoo and uh, who greets me as if I have been away for like about five years usually. Um, and then my youngest daughter who equally enthusiastically runs and sort of, you know, knocks me over in the, uh, which is quite fun. And there's nothing like that, I think. I mean, not everybody is a mom and not everybody has that, but um, yeah, I would recommend a dog, you know, that's for sure. <laughs> so, I mean, it's kind of sweet. The other day I forgot my uh, phone and I went bound to the tube station. I was, I came back and I'd only been gone like six minutes. I timed it because I was thinking, do I have time to go back? And uh, anyway, he again greeted me like as if I'd been at work all day, which was kind of, <laughs> I was trying to explain. He was looking, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm going again, you know, so it's kind of, <laughs> so, oh, well, maybe he's a dog of little brain, but he's very sweet. So, <laughs> so you're caring for a lot of people. So yeah. how do you nurture your team uh, at, at LG and at the same time manage to develop your, your own, I mean, w your self-development? I mean, what do you do for yourself? So that's a good question because I think um, certainly when I, I changed jobs, um, so I, I left Newton almost two years ago and it um, there was certainly then a very big sort of time of introspection for me mental space I did write the book but also it was um time with the family and it was you know time when I felt both re-energized but also um you know it's slightly poignant because I realized how many corners I'd cut over the preceding you know 25 years or so because um I was rushing in and out of the house and I and it has reminded me of the need um since then I've tried to take more sort of sort of gaps um I haven't always succeeded, it's got to admit. Um, I do the cliche for women of my age, and I do Pilates, which is so blooming difficult that sometimes it's very good for mental health as well, I've realized, because the difficulty of the exercises crowds out any other, any other thoughts in my head. Um, so it's almost like doing meditation, but I haven't, I haven't got a single formula. Sitting outside in the garden, baking a cake with my uh, daughters is kind of like the closest thing to completely chilling. <laughs> and what about writing a book? <laughs> that must yeah. be like, a, you know, a very intense experience. Yeah, well, I have a I have a son who, at the time I was writing this, was 18, and he's written a, um, now two, actually, science fiction books, and he said, Mom, you're so naive. I think he used a rude word, actually. Um, no one can write a book, you know. You've never written a book in that, in that short space of time. And actually, it became a more live project, and uh, I found it very challenging because I felt I had a lot to say, but actually writing a book is so different to writing an article. Um, and I've actually just finished doing the... Um, second edition it will come out in paperback and I've added you know things obviously we've had everything from the Brett Kavanagh uh, hearings a lot more around um, yes a whole you know follow-up from me too it was actually because of the time scale when you're writing uh, the publication I was writing to, you know up until it kind of went into print last time to kind of capture the latest things but um, and I've added a chapter on women money and power actually but I did find it challenging and I found it very fulfilling as well um, to, yeah, I suppose it's a discipline, like a lot of things to actually, if you write it down, kind of organizes your thoughts. And I learned things. I, I made sure I um, researched ideas that I'd sort of felt quite fixed in my mind, but they weren't really. Um, and again, that helped push forward my own understanding. So I think we're always all learning. Yeah. And um, what's, so... What's the impact for you fr from the book? What are the, the positive things that came out for yourself and, and for, for women uh, more generally? Well, opportunities like this come. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what I've, what I've um, through the book, I mean, I naively thought that, you know, you write it down and no one will want you to come and speak anymore because I thought, well, you've written it down. But of course, people more like want to come and discuss the book. Um, 
and I suppose it's it's opened. Um, I mean, there is there is a danger of becoming in any kind of bubble situation, like where particularly you know you're in women in you know corporate world or women in finance or women in boards or any kind of you know centric in you know, a small group. Um, and I think that's opened up, and it certainly provoked um, meetings and conversations with people that I would have never ever had the chance to meet. And again, they've taught me things about how I might have missed construed things, uh, things that I've overlooked, um, and I feel a, yeah, a richer understanding from from that, really. Um, and uh, and yes, again, I suppose I get invited into schools more now, which is exciting, because obviously it is about the next generation. I, I Sometimes people say, why do you say girl, not woman? I mean, it's partly alliteration. Um, uh, but also, I don't think it's necessarily a wonderful time to be a woman, because you could have had with that. It's increasingly a good time to be a girl, but actually somebody showed me a picture of their four and a half month old niece clutching my book, and I thought, oh, you know, that's probably about the right sort of age group for um, it really being a good time to be a girl, because I think we're on the verge now. I mean, the other reason to write the book was I felt, well, the reason to write the book was I feel quite frustrated about a lot of the diversity work and a lot of the fatigue around gender equality at the moment. And I feel a lot of it, the danger of me too, is that people get very confrontational against men. Whereas I actually think, you know, going back to the earlier point, you know, women can contribute to a, a much uh, more uh, fairer and um, more inclusive society, I think, as well as businesses. And I think we need to think of the, it in the context of bigger changes in the world, um, including technology enabling us to work somewhat differently. Um, but to be more ambitious about it, we're not just trying to replace the men we're trying to actually change things for the better and it's it's quite interesting because you're including men also in the in the conversation and that's a really important thing f for you to to achieve diversity and that's the work you're doing with the 30 percent club and you've published amazing number uh, this year that you've reached your target of 30 percent so it's not over but at least the FTSE 100 companies have now 30 percent uh, of women on, on their boards what was the journey from you know your initial idea of the 30 percent club to what it is today so i mean it was a very painful journey in the first few years actually because um although it now seems to be a success story and people more say oh well it's easy to get women on boards much harder to get women in executive management i mean it obviously is but but at the same time it was not a straight um line and uh, with a lot of hostility um at the beginning there were some wonderful men who were very enlightened who said yes of course um and they the members of the 30 percent club are the chairman um, because we were trying to change the boardroom and it was their boardroom and so they had to be involved and engaged on it and ideally to lead the charge and effectively that's what ended up happening but at the start when 99 of the FTSE chairman, 99 of 100, were men um, and there were 100 and, over 150 all-male boards in the 350 companies um, 12.5% women on the FTSE company boards and less than 8% on the 250. Um, I mean, this was not welcomed. Uh, one chairman um, said to me I was going to destroy British, British business, which um, I kind of was a bit puzzled by that, um, as if I had the power. But, you know, showed him what as he thought of women. You know, we were going to wreck the place. Um, and... Um, various other very open hostility to the idea and it was perceived at the time though what was interesting it was perceived as a women's issue it was perceived as not really to do with them in the main a few as I say enlightened and then over a period of quite a short time in the scheme of things it suddenly it became everybody's issue and actually part of being modern um, and today we have, um, in the FTSE, is actually 30.6 percent numbers out last week um, for September and for a October, I guess. We're, well, we've already we've gone a bit higher than we were at the end of the month. Um, only five all-male boards left in the 350. So remember, there were 151 going to five. I mean, that is, you know, a real sort of change in the mindset. 80% um, of the FTSE companies have at least 30% women on their board. So, I mean, this is kind of, a, you know, the revolution, really. And it's made me so excited about the opportunity to change things. It's, yes, on a small scale, yeah, it's a narrow objective, but if that can change, and remember this had not been, I mean, you know, in 1999, there was something like 7% women on boards, and it crept up a tiny bit over the next couple of decades. Um, and that was triggered by the financial crisis, that opportunity, really, which is why we have to kind of seize a moment. And that's why I feel all of the 
you know, the rise in populism, the kind of political machinations at present. They, people are calling out for new types of leaders. This is our moment, ladies. <laughs> and I, I feel even, you know, you don't need to be like really experienced actually to become a board member. And I thought, you know, even for us, it could be an amazing experience. You could start, you know, with charity. I mean, a lot of like small companies are looking for board members and that's really a good experience. Yeah, just do not assume you have to be in your 60s or in fact, you know, age diversity and having more people with particularly digital skills. I mean, this is always, I see so many, you know, executive search firms are, I'm not going to say lazy, but they often call me and say, do you know any women, you know, if, if that, oh, let me think now. But, you know, um, but often they're saying we need digital skills, we need technology skills, we need kind of, um, there's a realization that this is something very absent in many cases. If you have 60, I mean, there's still an average age of 60 on a FTSE company board. And um, that's, I think, the next big, you know, desire as well as ethnicity and so forth yeah no well I won't lead that one I mean somebody else can but uh, but there's a realization now anyway that the cozy club the sort of all boys network literally um and I have nothing against you know you know white middle-aged middle-class men of a certain you know kind of type we need everybody um but there's room for other types of people as well so when you lead this type of projects and we'll talk about the, the diversity project also are you afraid of failure? I mean, it's, this is quite a big project. You have a big name in the city and you put in front of this old man uh, this type of project because you need some support. Are you worried that you won't, I mean, you, you like to be liked. Are you worried it won't be accepted or it won't be seen like that the ro it's the right thing to do? So I haven't tended to operate like that. And I think maybe, um, I don't want to say there's something wrong with me that I don't like that, but actually it's been very handy for me not to be too afraid of, the, of failure. Um, and I do encourage, I mean, one of my biggest sort of tips for any anybody, man or woman, boy or girl, is, you know, do not let the fear of what might get, go wrong stop you from trying. Um, uh, Harvard Business School did a case study on the 30% club, and they invited me to help teach the first class. Um, I'd never even been to an MBA class. I hadn't taught one before. But before, it's, before I spoke, um, they divided the students up into five different groups. So one was the government, one was the chairman, one was the investors, et cetera. And they said, what could go wrong? And they came up with 57, it's like sort of, you know, is that flavors of baked beans or whatever, um, 57 things that could go wrong. And um, so the first thing I said when I stood up was, well, that's lucky that I didn't hear all that first. Some of them did go wrong, but it was more like, you know, maybe 10 or 15. The other thing is to let, we all fail. I want to make it very, very clear that every single day in my life, I have failures. I mean, I can list, if you're interested, loads that happened yesterday. But actually, the whole point is, and will happen today, it's too soon in the day to have too much to fail. I didn't burn anything this morning, and I laid the table correctly. Anyway, so, um, but that's part of, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, deal with that and not to either get carried away with hubris with your successes and too despondent with your failures. And, and I'm a human being, so there have been moments where I've just thought, oh, how do I pick myself up from this? But just have the objective, don't have to know all the different steps along the way. I mean, I'm sure when you're setting up VestPod, you didn't have all the answers, you've experimented, what works, what doesn't. Be open. Um, and you'll find, you know, you, you're, usually the path will open up. Yeah, I think it's you know resilience and trying to forget about the you know the, the failures. So what about the successes then? I mean, you must be very proud about all this you know the the thirty percent club about you know being a CEO at Newton. Do you celebrate success? Oh, definitely. I mean, I wrote a piece on the thirty percent barrier being broken. Um, uh, let's celebrate this moment, you know, because I think it's really important. Again, without getting sort of, you know, thinking, oh, job done, let's just sort of get on with the rest of our lives. But actually, I think we need to celebrate success. And um, I think we need to celebrate success uh, around us, not just our own, obviously. Um, and that's one of the things, again, I think often a lot of these projects are all about, you know, beating people up about the things they're not doing right. Whereas actually the ones that are doing brilliant, they need to be given a sort of the limelight and um, pat on the back um, or whatever. Uh, a version it is. So calling out great things is really important. So now I want to talk about your new role uh, mm -hmm. at, at LG. Uh, so you you're the head of personal investing. What, what does that mean? 
So as I mentioned, we've kind of got lots and lots of assets at Legal in General that are on behalf of big companies mainly, and there is a, um, a retail business, but that's through sort of private banks and so forth that would give money sort of in, a, in its kind of business-to-business -business relationships. And what we're trying to do now is going from this vast scale of business to directly to um, you know man or woman in the in the street. And um, I think the you know the the reason why I wanted to do this and um, you know, I really wanted to have a role that was combining, you know, commercial acumen with with a purpose. Was because clearly we have a lot of people who are under invested in this country, and who, um, you know, are going to suffer financial hardship if they don't look after themselves in this. And I, I guess I looked upon it a bit like, you know, how people didn't used to kind of belong to the gym or go running and so forth. Apparently in the 1960s, if you were jogging, you got stopped by police because it was a kind of suspicious activity. And, um, you know, now it's kind of part of every, a lot of people's lives, not everybody's lives, but, you know, it's, and, and to try to do something and, and work as well where necessary with public policy, you know, to try and leverage some of the things that I have been able to do, the relationships that I have in, you know, treasury and so forth. And I love your mission to, you know, engage the nation to save and, and invest more. So we'll talk about, you know, how you're trying to do that. Uh, but I've read that you're not driven by money, uh, but I still feel money is important. So what is, and that's a question I ask, like, you know, all the time with, uh, with the community and we try to answer this question, is, you know, what is money for you and what is financial independence? Because I think that's a good starting point to then, you know, start digging into our own finances and manage our own finances. So as um, I, I'm the breadwinner in our family, as the expression goes, and so I've always, since um, my husband, when we had our fourth child, he was a journalist and he decided to, um, actually work around the corner for Bloomberg, um, decided he wanted to, oh, did I say something wrong? No, um, he wanted to uh, stay at home and he freelanced for a while, but it, but it obviously put the onus on me. And so it's security is the word that you've just used and obviously if you have nine children and two of them have got married in the last year and you know I have a grandson now and so forth I mean I'm not exactly looking to retire tomorrow because that was um but it, it is important just for the you know uh, everything from school fees to kind of their helping them you know with uh, their futures so to, to me it's always been in a, a way a kind of yeah a means to you know security and for you know to have choices um and I think yeah, as w women particularly often, I've got lots of friends who stopped working um, because they felt they had choices when their children were young and then have struggled to come back to work. Um, that's another part of what I'm trying to do with things like the diversity project. But yeah, for me, it's, it's security, independence, choices, being able to, you know, give people things, you know, be generous with it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's r really interesting what, what you say. And, and the, next, the next point for me is, you know, once you manage to, to have some money, it's how you can, you know, work on your money. And that's this topic of, of investing. And it's a, it's a difficult one for women because we've heard, like, you know, women are not good investors. We're not investing enough. Investing is risky. And then there's all the jargon, to be honest, that, that, that's been, you know, imposed by banks. So we don't really understand what the financial industry is doing. That doesn't help us, you know, build our confidence. So what I mean, women are great investors. That's you know the reality of, of the research. What can we do to get you know more women uh, investing in the stock market, for example? Well, I think translating it into again something that Im impacts your real life. Um, and I think again, you mentioned the word jargon. All the all the research suggests that sometimes women feel they're being patronised. Sometimes it's all it seems complicated. I think we're just not talking the language of things about it being about them and what it would do for their lives. Um, I think there's a balance to be struck between the hope and the fear. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the, uh, some of you may have read something called Insuring Women's Futures, which is a um, great piece of work done by a group within the insurance industry. And it's pretty depressing though, because it suggests that at present, women at age 65 have a pension pot one fifth of the size of the average man's. So it's not one fifth less than, it's one fifth of. And as a result, a lot of women in later life then have you know, real financial hardship. So there's a, I think there's a little bit about what does it actually mean in real life and it's actually bringing it much closer and then being able to invest in things that you care about. As I mentioned, I think a lot of people worry, I think, that um, there, there are high fees that they're being ripped off, you know, there isn't a lot of trust, but then also 
they don't want to invest in companies that are harming the environment or treating women badly in their workforce or whatever. So um, again, one of the reasons to join Legal in General is because they had already worked very hard on, we had at that time, before I joined, a, a big climate change fund. So tilting, I mean, it's a, uh, more like a, um, a tracker, so it's not a active, it's not a, a high fee product, but it's actually enabling people to know that their money is being used to encourage companies to uh, move away from any harmful practices and then to develop more green revenues. And you've launched uh, recently the Girl Fund. So can you mm -hmm. talk about this initiative? So the Girl Fund or Gender in Leadership, people again, some people don't like the name. Um, I am um, uh, obviously from writing a book with this name and the subject. I mean, along the lines of this girl can and, you know, do it like a girl. I mean, I think it's quite empowering, the whole girl power thing. Anyway, the whole fund, again, it's, it's a UK equity fund. We've created our own index, so it's looking at all the companies in the 350 that the top listed companies in terms of market size, and then it's adjusting the weight of the portfolio, and it might zero weight them or it might double the weight according to four criteria. So it's women on boards, women in executive roles, women in the leadership, and women in the workforce. And if a company is doing nothing on any of those and scores below our minimum, they are excluded from the from the fund. And the idea is that we have, you know, the collectively, if and it, and it costs the same as, you know, the generic one, the generic fund. So the idea is you don't, and it's designed to track pretty closely the equity index. So the idea is you get equity type returns, but actually also are, you know, encouraging good things around gender equality. Um, and I think that's the way we need to approach it, that it's not kind of about a big sort of ethical, you know, this is, you know, how, and, and it might not, you might have to sacrifice returns, but actually this is just like, if you're going to invest in the stock market, why wouldn't you want to invest in a fund that is a bit more focused on this issue? Um, and all our funds in this particular range and the Future World range um, also have a climate impact pledge on top of it. So again, if a company globally is doing, you know, is not responding to our engagement on climate issues, we will divest from them. And so what about yourself? How, how are you invested? Uh, in a girl fund. <laughs> All your funds. Um, <laughs> although actually I've just got to do my husband's, now that the markets have fallen a bit, my husband's, um, I, I say, this is not advice, obviously. I'm not technically allowed to give advice. I'm just saying what I do myself. Um, he will probably uh, invest in the climate change one just so we're a little bit more diversified. Um, yeah, I mean, I have uh, been in the generation where actually, you know, initially in, the best investment was real estate, property and houses. And now, obviously, I don't think that's so much the case these days. And But yeah, I, I put my money where my mouth are. Um, and actually, this week I was going through just to show again, I have to kind of steal myself. I went off to talk to the bank about, you know, my whole, you know, my will and, you know, gone through all of that. And it's not, I mean, none of us kind of like, especially about your will, I mean, you know, it's not exactly the most um, thrilling sort of thing um, in many ways, but it reminds you to keep looking. And I was looking at how my pension's invested and whether I should uh, I move things um, uh, around. But I have, you know, I, I have classic sort of, you know, balanced funds, more equity than bonds, I have to admit, because I believe in the long-term future of those. And then more recent investments in these sort of more future world oriented. Thank you. And, and when did you start like looking at your finances and actively manage mm. your, your own finances? Because you were working in finance, so I suppose yeah. you were quite good at, at doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things one has to be conscious of is, is in any kind of role in, in the financial industry, you can't normally invest directly very easily because of the regulatory requirements. So although I used to invest more in individual companies, and um, then as I became more senior and as the rules became tighter, I invested in funds. Um, but yes, I guess it goes back to when I... Um, I suppose had some money to spare. That was the point. And um, early on, we did not. I mean, it's hard to believe now, but at one point... Uh, mortgage rates were like 15%, you know, and we had sort of the um, problems in the housing market here. So um, I suppose in my early 30s was more like when, you know, we had enough to think about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I think that's the other thing. That, that because I worked in finance, I was conscious of it, but I wouldn't necessarily have been otherwise. I think it was the same for me. I worked in private equity, actually, so I was investing a lot of other people's money without investing my, my own money. Yeah. And, and today, also, in terms of you know, other types of investment, uh, I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurs also in the room, and I know there's a big question around angel investing. So it's really hard when you're running a business that's you know, targeting women 
to raise money from angel investors, for example, because they're mostly male in their 60s. So how can we bring also, can we get more women to invest so in the stock market, but also in other types of investment that you know they really believe in, such as you know, angel investing? Well, I guess, again, telling your story, and I know you're very good at actually telling it, but getting it out to, um, particularly if you're interested in you know, crowdfunding or um, a different, more innovative ways of funding. I'm afraid I have uh, recently come across somebody who said to me, oh, well, because it's so difficult, this is the second round of funding that she's going for, I'm going to hire a man to do the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we, I was like, oh, this, is, this cannot be right. I mean, at the same time, we need to try and encourage more women into venture capital and private equity. Um, but in the meantime, I think actually making people aware there is this opportunity, and if a lot of people... Uh, got involved, even if it was relatively small individual investments, then, um, you know, it's a bit more like friends and family. But it's, I don't have a single, simple answer to it, because clearly, um, you know, then again, you have to set it up in a different sort of way so that people can benefit. Um, but obviously, yeah, this is one of our big challenges of the chicken and egg problem of not enough women in finance because they think it might be boring or, you know, less exciting than actually it can be, but also... Um, they can then help open the doors to more female entrepreneurs. Thank you, Elena. I think we're going to open for questions. Oh, well. I think I have three of them here, so maybe they should. <laughs> um, I mean, the reality is that if people aren't uh, interested in the purpose of what we're doing, they're not really going to be a good fit anyway. Um, and in fact, what's exciting about it is that not only of um, because the team has grown, you know, probably tenfold in the last sort of year, but it's still very small, uh, maybe fivefold actually. But we've got. Um, uh, just as many people who've joined us from within the firm who've uh, approached me and said, oh, I really like what you're doing. I think a lot of people who work in finance want to have a real purpose as well. Um, and it's not to say you can't make money in a good salary and it's, you know, it's not like we're saying, oh, come and work for free, you know. Um, but I think just turning it around and saying, actually, first of all, the purpose and the vision of what we're trying to do has to excite you. Um, Partly because I think then you're going to be better at doing the job. You know, it's got to be. I've learned if you if you enjoy your job, you're going to be much better at it. Um, but this is not for somebody who's just interested in kind of you know, you know, doing the perfunctory um, work and then sort of going home. It's somebody who's we, we need people who are excited about it. And I haven't found it difficult to attract them. I'm, I have to say so. Great, thanks so much for sharing your story. And it's incredibly inspiring to hear all the different things that you've done. What would you want your legacy to be, of all the range of things? Yeah, what do you hope it would be? So, I mean, when I um, left Newton, one of the things that people, I got approached by people from outside the industry, and I had a real sort of reflection moment about whether I wanted to, you know, completely, I mean, I've got to admit, I've been sometimes quite disillusioned by how slow the pace of change is in finance. And I thought, actually, you know what? It's the hardest thing, probably, but I do not want to leave the finance industry in the same way, pretty much. I mean, it's improved a bit um, as I joined it. Um, and I feel that that's a very unfinished business. Um, for me, le the, the real legacy overall will be my family. And also, um, if I can, and I feel with the book, it only got partially there. If I could change the dynamic, and I see, I see now more, and it's not just me obviously saying it, but others saying, actually, this is all about diversity of thought. It is about um, changing the, the straight-jacketed expectations around men's role in society as well. I mean, if we can get, if we could fast forward 10, maybe it's 20 years, and see that we've got much more even balance between men and women doing roles, that would be, I would feel I'd paid a bit of a part in that. Um, so I, I can't claim it's just one thing, but um, yeah, I, I have a, a big ambition that we kind of turn around and we say, well, why do we ever, imagine that we ever needed a 30% club? Imagine we ever needed a diversity project, you know. I'm going to persevere with that not being wistful thinking. <laughs> Um, 
I think it's really important that, and I really like that you said that accessing a board isn't just for being in your 50s and 60s. I started, I was on a board of a school when I was 24, and now I run the board at the age of 30. So I think there is access for every woman in this room. Just don't always explore the traditional avenues. I think that's really pivotal. I think my question is, you mentioned briefly the gender pension gap. And this is, I think, the next thing coming over the hill following the pay gap around discrepancy in income and wealth. And for me, when I look at my teachers, um, they are not going to be necessarily the direct consumer for LNG, Barclays Wealth, all of that. So what role does the key incumbents in the industry have for supporting people who may not be um, on such a high income or working self-employed or fundamentally working in a gig economy? What role do they play? So we are trying, and obviously we're only just started, so we haven't got a lot to show for it yet, but in terms of, um, I mean, the minimum investment is £100 lump sum or £20 uh, regular uh, contribution thing. So it's not about being wealthy to get started. This is trying to say, actually make it an everyday situation. Um, the difficulty, of course, is if people leave it too late and um, you know just don't have the amount of money that they would need now to invest for their future. So I guess what we're trying to do is go back right to the early stages and say actually even in I mean in schools and so forth actually make sure we have financial education it just becomes as I said about health just another part of your life um, and every you know quarter you spend a half a day on your finances or you know kind of get it sort of ingrained in people that actually it's not you're not to be defeatist about it I mean I do see students for example think well I'll never pay off my student debt um, whereas actually you know if you go in with that attitude you um, and I'm not saying because they eat avocados all the time at all. It's because they literally haven't got any money. Um, but clearly, you've, you've, you've got to try to get that um, interest going. Um, and there's small amounts that can grow. Um, and that is what we're trying to do, um, albeit sort of only just started out. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I had a question regarding the gender diversity initiatives. I think sometimes they can lead to kind of negative comments. So for example, at business school, you're told, oh, you got the job because you're a woman. What work? Um, what is kind of your advice when, you, when you're confronted or when we are confronted to these types of comments? I think you're right. I think there is, at this point, unfortunately, we've got a sort of lose-lose situation in the sense that we haven't kind of finished the job and yet sort of resentment has um, sort of set in in some quarters. And I think there's two things. One is that I think it's incredibly important, as by luck more than anything else, the 30% club did, we, to involve the traditional talent pool, you know, i.e. the men who might feel otherwise displaced, in the whole conversation. Because actually, if they could see it as a as a growth story, as kind of you know improving profits, as helping with their own you know challenges they might have, then um, they're much more inclined to be supportive. I think as well, uh, occasionally, if just because you get you know there might be some sort of intimation that you've got the job or you've got the position because you're a woman. Um, I mean, I I think with hindsight, there have been occasions when. I mean, at one stage when I was a fixed income fund manager, uh, all my competition weren't all just men, but they were all called Paul. And there were five of them. I mean, uh, so I'd go to these investment, you know, panels and it would be Helena, Paul, 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 and Paul. And, um, you know, I'd get more airtime and then sometimes I won awards. And I'm not sure if it was because I was the only person that the judges could actually identify that I won. But, you know, I learned to sort of take it and think, OK, well, I'll just make sure that I'm, I'm worthy of the job and then I prove it in the market and I'll just ride through that. And they might have that perception, but, you know, more fool on them because I'm capable of doing it. So I wouldn't let it bother you too much and certainly not to prevent you taking the job or, you know, because we've got to sometimes have our lucky breaks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is an echo of your um, own challenge, Emily. Really, isn't it? I think, I think sharing sharing the stories, but maybe maybe one of the 
events that you might host might be, you know, women who are, are entrepreneurs. I mean, maybe you've done this already. Women who are entrepreneurs, founding, um, wanting to start up, sharing their story with women who have the money. Um, I have talked to somebody recently who's an, uh, who is wealthy, who's a woman, um, and she said one of her challenges is that she's only approached by women, and a lot of the time it's, you know, it's uh, hard for her to... I say yes to everything or, you know, to distinguish. But I think actually getting it so that there is, a, in the first instance, a network created of women who are interested in um, supporting other women uh, through uh, their businesses. Because obviously we know that women do brilliantly often. Uh, that Boston Consulting Group study that shows that on average, even though we get a lot less dollars to start with, we make twice as much revenue or whatever as the men. So it's not as if we've got bad business ideas, um, I think it's about making those connections and gradually getting it so the men actually want in on the action and are, you know, uh, sort of wanting to fund, but not that you have to go about it the same sort of, you know, resonating with them, um, your messages, but actually selling it as you wish to. But I think creating a network is incredibly important, it? which is what you're trying to do, I gather. And getting a few success stories out there and showing, showcasing those as well, making sure that it's not just seen as... I don't, I don't think you want to characterize as anything like philanthropy or charity. This is about you know, great businesses with uh, great ideas, great women backing them, and then you know, creating this vicious, vicious virtuous circle, <laughs> moving from the vicious spiral that we're in and creating a virtuous circle. So on the first, I think because I ended up um, having a very exciting start to my career, I spent a couple of years, as I said, in New York, and I got this very broad experience then. When I came back, even though it was tough, um, although I was in two minds about whether to carry on after that initial disappointment about the promotion that I didn't get, uh, particularly the reasons for it, I guess at that point I, I already had one child. I... Um, I'm not a quitter, and I felt, you know, actually, I'm good at my job. I'll at least give it one more go. Um, I think if the Newton job hadn't worked out, you know, even in terms of just being normal working out, uh, things might have been a bit different. But I do think it's very important to recognize that sometimes not enjoying your job is, you know, to do with the culture and the circumstances. And actually, it's a lot of, you know, the reason why I, I got somewhere was because I persevered. Um, but if I'd persevered in the same firm as I joined, I probably wouldn't have gotten it. That was where I realized there were no ally, not enough allies to really support me. I've used that word a few times. So you've got to make a judgment about the culture always. And then there are firms, even in financial services, that you know have a good culture. Um, on aptitudes and things, one of the things I recognized that I didn't know before the 30% Club was that I realized that I can persuade people. And I think it's an under sort of sung kind of you know attribute because actually, it, I didn't go in in a militant or threatening way when I was trying to persuade the chairman. Even the ones who were very hostile towards me, I kind of backed off and I thought of a new ways in. But the, um, I do think it's really important to uh, sometimes realize that people, again, going back to this idea of not telling people what to do, but actually trying to make them feel almost it's like their own idea. Um, and I, I have always tried to... Um, not say, well, this is all. This is not about territory. This is not about sort of me being right here. This is about you believing in it. Um, so I think that's something that I would call out. So. Thank you. Hello. I absolutely loved your book. It was a real pleasure to read. Um, and I was also very excited to find out about the Gender and Leadership Fund, um, which actually got me excited about looking at investing but what I found fascinating about this fund is that it's actually showing that the greater the diversity the better it is for business um, so do you foresee um, the future of how companies are valued on not just for this fund in particular but for these criteria to be rolled out through all the funds as in a good for business um, attribute I do I think one of the um uh, difficulties is is, is that uh, pr you can't really prove that it's you know causally related to you know the women being there or any other form of diversity um, because clearly you can't have a sort of control group where you're saying oh you over there you're not allowed to have any women on your boards well we'll see how you perform relative to this group but all of the empirical evidence suggests and there are lots of different studies that have been done um, albeit on somewhat limited historical data because obviously this is quite a new breakthrough for women to be on the boards or in the executive roles 
So they all positively, it shows a positive correlation between financial performance and um, more balance. Uh, there's, it's slightly bizarre because st I'm still asked repeatedly the business case for having, say, women on boards. And I'm like, well, where's the business case for having only one type of person? Um, and they say, well, this is the status quo and you're trying to prove so, you know, the need for change. I think it will become expected of companies. So it's either going to become like a share price premium in terms of, you know, actually these companies are really forward looking. Usually if they're good about this issue, they're also forward about technology, about the competitive pressures around the world, etc. It's not usually just a one item agenda. Um, but also then I think firms will become punished for being behind on these sorts of issues. And one thing I would call out is since the publication of gender pay gap data in this country, CEOs um, have come forward who are really worried about the, um, the uh, perception issues um, around having the largest pay gaps. It's really heightened their resolve, even if you can argue for maybe the wrong reasons, but it's kind of good. Whatever motivates them is good, you know. Um, so I, I do think so, yeah. Uh, good morning, and morning. thank you very much for your time. I'm a massive fan of yours, so really pleased. Thank you, Emily, for putting on this event. Um, this is, I feel yeah, like very good for my ego. Yeah. Into, uh, <laughs> I think um, I'll just stay here all day. Right? <laughs> I have a two-part question, if that's okay. So um, I'm a mom of two daughters, and obviously you're a mother yourself, and have excelled in your career. Um, there's a lot of data around the gender pay gap that shows that up to two thirds of it might be attributed to motherhood. So um, the propensity of women after they've had children to return to work part time, or in many cases not return to work at all because the conditions are not right for them to return in a way that matches their lifestyle. Um, I suppose part one of my question is, I suppose what responsibility do you think companies have in helping to bring women back into the workforce. So is this kind of intersection between companies and government and also personal responsibility for the women themselves? And then the second part of my question is, for moms or just women in general, what role do you think financial advice plays in you know, helping us to get more into investing? Because I think financial advice is one of those parts of the industry that's a bit, a bit dusty, a bit kind of stale. Um, and of course, for women that haven't invested in the past for whatever reason, they're gonna be even less inclined to go and get financial advice because they wouldn't trust the people that are giving them the advice in the first place. Great. Well, I think um, it's a great question on the re returning to work or how to juggle things. Because what I'm not saying in any way is that actually, you know, success in this life is all about kind of working every hour that God gave you and not spending any time with your family. What I feel sad about at present is that so many women of my age or, you know, somewhat younger often, but can't find a way back in. And I think it is incumbent on companies and sectors. I mean, within the diversity project in the fund management industry, we've now got a returnship program. We've got a database. Companies individually struggle a little bit to put in place um, a whole sort of scheme, even if they're big companies like Legal in General, because it's quite a lot of you know extra work. But they all see the need to, um, to create better uh, opportunities and way back in. And I think this is a huge, it's like a dam waiting to burst, you know, well, if we can make it so that it's not just about binary decisions in life that you kind of stop work and then you can never return or you have to set up your own business because there's no way back in. But it's much more fluid, it's much more around flexible working for everybody in the sense of kind of how you, how you work. Um, I'm excited about that as I think a real sort of breakthrough. And I think I just encourage women who are maybe out of the workplace, and again, this goes back to how we advertise all of this, that that they are open to the possibility, you know? So I know we've talked about serving on trustee of a charity or a governor of a school and so forth. Actually, you know, keep your hand in, you know, keep sort of thinking, actually, one day I might go back. And it's really hard with new mums to tell them, oh, one day you might want to sort of go back, but really important. So I think we all have a bit of responsibility, but this is a great opportunity for us to really great, great, female talent back in that may not have seen a way forward. Financial advice, I mean, we are looking, um, and there are obviously people who are offering sort of robo advice, um, as it's called. I think the name is a bit unfortunate because it sounds a little bit like clinical and robotic, obviously. Um, but we are looking into this about how we would offer that and make it so that it's, yeah, might be sort of digital first, you know, you kind of can do a lot of the questions online so you don't have to feel embarrassed that you don't know stuff. But then you could call somebody. Because one thing we've realized is people, have, people who haven't invested before, 
get really rightly so nervous about you know handing over a big sum of money for them and uh without sort of really you know it's not like ordering a book on amazon you get it the next day or two hours later if you've done it on prime you know you just don't get anything to show for it so the idea of we realize people want to talk to somebody as well as probably go a certain amount of you know the way online so i think it is a way back but it's not having really expensive you know condescending i'm going to tell you you know what you've got to do sort of thing but much more so that it's about understanding somebody's needs and then you know helping them i don't think that should be beyond the wit of woman anyway <laughs> Elena, thank you so much. Uh, it was really like a fantastic event. Mm -hmm.